and we are live. Another episode of Digital Trends Live is about to begin. Here are some of the topics we'll be covering today. The rumors have been confirmed. There is indeed going to be a Nintendo Switch Lite. We'll get you the details, the price, the availability, and more. And could Facebook's recently announced cryptocurrency Libra already be in trouble before it's even launched? We'll tell you about how certain governments aren't very stoked on it. And breaking news, people are trying to steal your stuff. Keeping our data and passwords secure has never been more important. And Darren Gucciani of Keeper Security will join us to discuss their platform. And have you ever put together a PowerPoint presentation and then somehow accidentally deleted the most important slides? You are not the only one. James Entra of Shuffler will discuss their platform, all that, and a whole lot more on today's episode of Digital Trends Live. I could see the Airwolf helicopter flying right over this. I think it would be perfect. Wouldn't that be awesome? I think it's prime for a comeback. You know what I love about Airwolf though is like that cave is like the ultimate like supervillain cave from James Bond, but it's a good guy. But it's a good guy. Yeah, yeah. it's the best of all worlds. Yeah. All right, this is something that that the tech world needs to get on. Hello everyone, this is Digital Trends Live. This is our daily show here from Digital Trends, where we bring you the trending tech topics of the day, news, headlines, interviews, and so much more, all while broadcasting live across a number of different platforms. So wherever you're finding us, thank you. But in case you didn't know, we're on LinkedIn Live, Periscope, Twitter, Twitch, we're on Facebook, we're on YouTube, we're on Daily Motion, Apple News, two different mobile apps, whatever kind of phone you're using, we've got an app for you, and we've even got an app for smart televisions. So you can download that and watch right on your TV at home, or you can go to Digital trends.com slash live, where we also have a chat board where you can join in, discuss things, whatever platform you're on, we appreciate it. So drop in your comments, your questions throughout the show and your opinions on Airwolf. Right now, I'm Craig Nibbler, joined by Dan Gall. Hello, Dan. Hello. How are you? Doing well. <laughs> you know what's stuck in my head is that sound of the, of the helicopter engine. Yes. Like that jet turbine. Yeah. That I want to I wanna recreate that. Yeah. Verbally, and I can't. <laughs> I can't quite do it. The science isn't there yet, but we will, we will so work on that. frustrating. We need a whole separate show just for Airwolf. But before that, let's talk about the trending topics of the day. And the first one is this, uh, kind of uh, spreading all over the place. We knew that uh, this was going to be a big, a big topic in tech uh, because people have been, this has been rumored for a while. And I'm talking about the Nintendo Switch Lite finally being confirmed. And uh, Nintendo released a video today showcasing it, showcasing a whole bunch of different aspects of it, and uh, it is confirmed we are going to be getting this Nintendo Switch Lite. Yeah. Is this something that you, do you use a Nintendo Switch currently? You know what, I don't, but I would love to, and the reason why yeah. I don't, like, I would love, because I fly out to New York and stuff all the time, mm -hmm. and um, I always bring my iPad so I can watch movies or Netflix. If it had Netflix on it, yeah, I would be 100% on the Switch. I agree. On my flights. I feel like that would be the, the big game changer for them that would push us so many people I onto just don't that. Get, why not? Yeah. Like it's the perfect travel device. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. And so that's with the Switch. So the Switch Lite, they're looking at as a more compact version. You just a couple of things about it. So it's going to come in at $199. And uh, you can, let's see, with it, the Switch Lite has a couple of things. You can't connect it to your television. So it's not meant to be that. It's meant to be kind of a companion to the regular Nintendo Switch. And this one, uh, the Joy-Con controllers are built in, so it's all one solid unit. Yep. So it, it comes I, with a plus pad. Plus pad. Yep. yep. The plus pad is a, an actual plus pad. Um, it's got uh, slight, they said slightly improved battery life, but that's hard to tell what exactly that means. Yep. And how that actually works out. Anytime a company says that, it's like, eh. it's, It could be a half hour, 10 minutes, two right. hours. Who, who knows, Yeah, depending right? on what game you use or how hard exactly. you're using it. Um, different, multiple colors. They've got yellow, gray, turquoise, and a special Pokemon Sword and Shield edition. It'll only play games that support handheld mode. So that's, okay, so only games that support handheld mode. So no, that's, no Mario Party. Yeah. Uh, stuff like that. But apparently there's a ton of games that support handheld mode. So Yeah, they did They did showcase in this, it was like a seven minute uh, video they did, uh, just kind of promoing it. And they did showcase a, a number of games that are gonna be for it. But I wanna know what people think. Is this, is a Nintendo Switch Lite 
something that you've been wanting? Is that something that you're excited to get? Is, or is this something that's it's like, well, I already have a Nintendo Switch, why would I go for the light, lighter version? Uh, I mean, yeah, the first thing in my head is what was old is new again, because yeah. they, they released something like this a long time ago, and it was a huge flop. Obviously, the Switch is amazing, and it's yeah. not a flop, but right. now they're kind of going backwards again. I, th I felt like the Switch is already pretty portable. Like, yeah. Um, I don't get it, and the, and, the, and, the, and the battery life's decent. It's like two, two and a half hours to six hours, depending on what you're doing on it. I mean, for a portable gaming system, that seems about what standard, what it, what it should be standard. I guess the pricing, you know, it's $200. It's priced yeah. really nice. Yeah. Um, it's it might not... be great for kids. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I suppose so, and it's a little bit more portable. I mean, it's a little bit smaller than what the regular Nintendo Switch is. But yeah, to me, I think I would love the Nintendo Switch, I think that would be great. I don't know if I would go for the smaller version or not. If you're going to go for it, like, might as well go for that one. But I guess the portability factor may be, a, may be more of an... I guess maybe we need to get our hands on it. That is exactly the case. Like, Nintendo. The screen, the screen, five and a half yeah. inches versus 6.2. Like, yeah. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it... It's actually, that's pretty substantial. That adds up, I suppose, yeah, yeah when you're doing it, uh, when you're putting that into your pocket or into your backpack. backpack. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and since there's just a couple of notes on the Nintendo Switch, they sold uh, almost 35 million units so far. And there's also the rumor that there's going to be a more powerful Switch coming out soon. Oh, so This cool. was kind of the dual. Maybe that'll support Netflix. And that I could see, yeah, being being something like that, something a little little beefier that can, yeah, support some streaming television. That would be great because I think think like you said, that would be like that would be the game changer. Yeah. Yeah. If you could have that added in there. Um. And what what do you think about that? So uh, let us know. Drop in your comments. What do you think about the colors? Yeah, the colors. That's that's certainly true. They're, I mean, we've got they're four like different colors. Lickable green. <laughs> yellow the gray is actually i think the gray is really cool looking the gray looks cool yeah. yeah that's probably the one that i would go for um i would like to see a black but you know i guess that might get a little bit hot but still i think that's, uh, that's what i would go for is it can i get hot i don't, I don't know, know. That's, just, that's just something you say <laughs> uh, so the, again we're talking about the nintendo switch Lite. so launch date september 20th so they've already got that out we're guessing, at least according to some of the rumors, uh, let's see, the George here may not be the best use case, but I, I've never plugged my Switch to my TV. Can you still add a better controller? Good question. I'm not entirely sure on that, um, if you can add it. You can, I think it supports Bluetooth. Uh, the article says uh, that you can uh, attach Joy-Cons that support um, the functions that the, the device itself doesn't. The, okay. The, the light, the Go version, the light version. Yeah, the light version. Yeah. Nintendo Switch Lite. Yeah, yeah. so I guess, uh, I guess you can add something in. So uh, definitely, um, I, I mean, I, it's definitely a cool advancement. I think I'm kind of excited to see what the Nintendo Switch, the bigger one, is going to be. And they haven't confirmed that, but this has been the long time rumor. So they had a light version, and then they had the, the heavy version that's going to be coming out. Yeah, I'm really curious to see who the demo is they're going after. Because, yeah. again, it's already pretty portable. Like, if it's yeah. in a, I mean, I mean... When you're going places, usually you got a backpack. Right. Yeah. It's I see a ton portable. of kids with them, you know, like, I guess this to me is like kind of like the more portable version for like kids or something like that. Or maybe because the controllers don't come off, it's, you know, you don't, you're not going to lose stuff. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, we are being corrected here in the chat. I'm seeing Ian said the Switch already supports Hulu. So I guess it does have some streaming television on it. It's not Netflix. But it's not Netflix. That's the thing. <laughs> see, Ian. I mean, you were close. but Hulu's great. <laughs> I like Hulu a lot, but I, I spend more time on Netflix personally. Yeah. I'm just being selfish. Yeah. yeah, and maybe that's a Netflix thing. Maybe they haven't allowed it to be on there, although I kind of doubt that. That I think we would think they'd want it to be everywhere. Yeah. I don't know. Definitely Thank something you, to think about. I appreciate yes, that. That is, you are, you are correct, and that is why we like the comments when they come through here Keep at Digital Trends. We love to read what people have, and this is why this is interactive, and we love having these discussions. And speaking of that, it's now time for some Read em and Weep. This is where we take a look at some of the comments that come through across our many different platforms, and we answer them directly, directly to you right now. You who wrote that, now we're going to talk to you. So Ian that's what's Taylor? Happen. Uh, no, not Ian. No. Ian, well, we already Ian talked didn't to make Ian. me weep at all. No, Ian didn't make yeah, us weep. Made me yeah, Thank nice you. try, Ian. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Charles, let's let's see what you could do here. Breaking: President Trump is no longer allowed to block people on Twitter. Court rules. OMG, that's breaking news. I can sleep better now. Um, that's actually, it is pretty big news. I think it's a pretty big deal. That is a huge deal. Because that what the ruling was, was that basically it's 
a public uh, public address from a public figure, so he cannot block somebody. So, you know, uh, what was the first thought in your head when you heard that? Uh, well, I mean, I had a lot of thoughts that I'm probably not going to share. <laughs> well, I, I what was my, your first thought? My, my first thought was, like, all the spammer, trolls, all that stuff, it's like free grant. It's going to totally... Oh, man. You know, They're like, going to go nuts. Yeah. Yeah, like, it's, it's going to dilute anything that he has uh personally and i'm wondering just also, in the comment threads and uh, it, yeah uh, messages like yeah can you imagine trying to manage that as a social media manager or something like that not that i think no. he uses one but yeah <laughs> that's like i'm just giving up like right <laughs> <I'm out. laughs> yeah. this job is not worth it it's kind of like that guy that has to count jelly beans at a jelly belly factory <laughs> like, like oh, there's your, a your job is useless oh, there's no. another one oh, there's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. is there day. some type of automation for that no <laughs> Oh, it's got a, locked. <laughs> got a whole team on, on it. Yeah. 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 Charles, uh I think it's bigger than that, but I'm glad that you can sleep better now. No matter what no matter what you're doing. I don't know what the emojis were. Josh, regarding PowerBeats Pro versus Apple AirPods, how much better are the beats? Everybody who's making their decision off of a Bluetooth connection needs their their ass kicked. Period. Okay. So very angry over this. The Bluetooth connection, I am gonna say, is pretty important. That, I would think that's that's a pretty important aspect. I think Bluetooth connection is super important, um, but when it's something on your ears, yeah, is it really that important? The most important I mean, thing is that it has it. Yeah, I guess it depends on how. Maybe it's not necessarily the Bluetooth connection, but connectivity in general. Like if it's cutting out, that would be that would an be issue. well. That means it's not doing its job. Like yeah, it's not fulfilling true. the need that it's supposed to be fulfilling. It's supposed to be connected. Yeah. But if you're like setting your headphones, you know, 40 feet away or, you know, walking away and then uh -huh. coming back and the connection's not there. It's like, all right, well, like I can't, it's not long distance. So yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know that I'm not familiar with this particular story, but, um, I, I'm curious what the, uh, what the complaint really is. Yeah. Whether it's just, just that, I mean, I know if this was, it's probably Parker that did this review, Parker or Ryan. Um, and I'm going to guess that they, uh, they do some pretty thorough testing other than that. But if that's that's the concern. The thing the thing that drives me nuts about Bluetooth connectivity with headsets is more when um, something tries to take it over. So mm. like uh, if you're on your phone and you're listening yeah. to something, and you get in the car or something like that, and the car kind of takes over the connection. That's annoying. Uh, it's super annoying because you're like, yeah. ah, like or uh, and the again, volumes don't match too, and so one's like way louder than the other one. Yep. Yeah. The other thing yeah. that drives me nuts is uh, you know again on flights, I have my my um, my my phone or my um, Oh, oh my gosh! Now I'm your phone or your uh, yeah. Your we were just talking about it. Anyways, yes, you're, you're <laughs> when another device takes <laughs> it, when I like, I want to pull out my yeah. phone and listen to music, and it's like, oh, connected to my laptop or yeah. connected to uh, my iPad or something like that. Instead, and I gotta, you know, it's just it's, it's stupid. It's just annoying. Yeah, yeah, it's annoying. No, I agree. It makes me weep. Yes. So, Josh, the ending line was uh, Bluetooth can be important, I guess. That's what we'll go with one that one. Josh, uh, Di Diamante. Oh, Rainbow Selena. All right, I like, that's, I don't know why, but that's that's a good one. That is. Uh, regarding Google is adding new underwater locations to Street View. Wow, can you imagine all the mermaid pics? So many possibilities for Easter eggs. <laughs> <laughs> why? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, you go. You find them, Rainbow Selena. I think that. Uh, she I, sounds very impressed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm with her. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, yeah. Mermaid picks, man. I mean, can you do Street View? <laughs> I, do, I, guess, I guess so, yeah. Well, uh, I hope that whenever you find them, these Easter eggs, please send them into Digital Trends. Can you like, get the job know. to be the driver for that, though? For the, for the Street View? <laughs> <laughs> the underwater Street View. I want to be the sub-driver of that. That yes. would be fun. It would be scary after a while. Maybe you get used to it. Yeah. Like, your whole day is I literally an, just being underwater. I would take an Uber. If it was an underwater <laughs> taxi, Man, I don't know. I don't know if I would actually. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be the first one. They, they'd be lost. Yeah, it's it's probably much worse <laughs> underwater. Uh, Have Anoki. you ever driven downtown before? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just got here. <laughs> Imagine that conversation when you're no, a thousand that's not feet a underwater. One and a half. <laughs> <Yeah>. No, <laughs> you're stuck. Regarding new Sony WF. 1000 XM3 versus Apple AirPods. So another review, Sony Sound tramples AirPods. I had already decided to purchase the Sonys until I saw that case. Good God, man, that's huge. If the case doesn't fit in my pocket without causing a major bulge, I will not be purchasing them. <laughs> you are right. The case is big for those. It does look nice, but we had those actually here um, a couple of days ago. Parker came in 
with those. It is a pretty big case. A lot of a lot of them have pretty big cases. Yeah, uh, they're not the AirPod size cases. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that's really about just maintaining battery life on them, right? And being able to charge them. I would think so. I would, you know, so this is where you need the light version. Yeah. Like, you know, playing off the Nintendo right? Switch Lite. Yeah. You need the light version of the carrying case, right? Yeah. Like, yes. yeah, those big cases make, again, sense when you have a backpack. Like a day-use case or like a travel case or something I, like that. You know, when I had AirPods, I put them in my pocket. I had the case in my pocket all the time. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree. I didn't lose them? Uh, no, I didn't, but my son has. <laughs> See, that's what I would worry about. That's why I would probably want the bigger case. But you know what he does? Because it's harder for me to misplace. He doesn't put them in the case, his AirPods, he'll, he'll, or AirPods. He'll put them in, like, a pocket. Oh, no. And then when we're running, or, like, say, again, air, you know, flying or whatever. Yeah. Try having to run through the airport, and it'll, like, fall out, and he doesn't know it until we get to the gate. And we're uh, like, oh, no. No, trying to find <laughs> one little, one little ear pod. Yes. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's almost impossible. That's maybe why you want a big case. Um, I know. I know. We need to get through these and get to some more news here too. Uh, I am seeing one comment on YouTube regarding the uh, underwater side. Uh, Drew says maybe maybe Google Earth will help us find Nemo. Uh, so thank you for that. Oh. That is on YouTube. All right, Josh. So regarding, you can check in on Bill Nye's solar sail as it orbits Earth. Bill Nye is good at remembering old DS, DS9 episodes, and that's about it. Oh. Wow, Josh. Come on now. Yeah, Bill Nye is great. Bill Nye is pretty awesome. I'm, I don't think it's just Deep Space Nine, and yes, I know what DS9 is, but um, I think If there was one guy creeping on me, I would love it if it was Bill Nye. I'm just going to leave that <laughs> as a soundbite that we can cut out later for a uh, best of moment. Um, <laughs> there's the highlight for, for the next All Hands Me. <laughs> but <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> I agree. Bill Nye's awesome. He I, is. He is. Yeah. I love him. He, no. He, I mean, he just became viral again like, uh, what was that, like a month or so ago? A uh, month or so ago for, yeah, for his, his video on climate change. But I mean, even his show on Netflix is awesome. Bill Nye is Bill Nye's badass. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah, so hey, sorry. that made me cry. You're wrong. I didn't weep. I cried on that one. <laughs> so <laughs> congratulations, it worked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to some more news here. We need to get through a few topics uh, before we go on to our interview, which is coming up. Uh, this is something actually that you and I talked about a week ago when there was a rumor that came out about HBO Max, which is going to be Warner Media's, which we, we had heard was going to be Warner Media's streaming service. It is officially confirmed. Warner Media confirmed. put out a press release saying yep. it's going to be called HBO Max. And it's going to include a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff. Uh, I feel like it's... Um, so my question is, what happens to all these reruns on TV? Because yeah. it's literally, you're paying to get the reruns, but yeah. I, at any time in the full catalog, I guess, right? Yeah, they've got a whole bunch of them that are coming through. So, so uh, essentially, HBO customers will be able to port over, I think it's for like, a, they, they think it's going to be 17 bucks a month, which on, at, um, and the outset kind of sounds like a lot of money until you realize everything that you're getting with it, and I don't know if that's worth it for people or not. So here's some of the things you'll get. You'll get uh, all of Friends. Friends mm -hmm. is going over in 2020. That's huge. Which yeah. is huge. Yeah. Yeah, Netflix paid $100 million just for this year. Whoa. <laughs> oh, God. That's the best that acting ever. That pretty much paid for the HBO Max plus yeah. 10, yeah. at least. <laughs> yeah, just that alone. Yeah. So you'll get all of Friends, but then you're also going to get a whole bunch of other old series that Warner, Warner owns, like The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Pretty Little Liars. There's a new programming that's going to be on there. Um, a Riverdale spinoff, which that'll probably be huge because I know people who love Riverdale love Riverdale. Um, and then there's all kinds of other partnerships Shazam. they've created. Yeah, Shazam, Some movies. DC movies. Yeah. And the Gremlins prequel. The Gremlins that is prequel. Animated. Yeah. Yep. It's going to be awesome. Watch that. Um, and then on a, on a Kendrick or Anna Kendrick uh, spinoff. So a lot of different original content that's going on there. And then you also get all of that stuff that comes with HBO. So at 17 bucks a month, if that's it, that's not 100% confirmed, that's what they think it's going to be. How is that worth it to you? Is with all of that stuff, with all of that programming, I mean, and there's tons more, um, is that going to be worth it to you to switch over to that and add or add that into your catalog? And what if you're already paying for HBO? Are you willing to pay for double or are they going to go I think buy HBO's a package deal for like a dollar more or something? Yeah, I think it's going to be like one or two bucks more because you'll and then you'll just wrap it in. At I, that deal it's almost it's it's hard to say no to it if you're already a subscriber to hbo so who uh i would love to know because like I, I used to never subscribe to hbo showtime cinemax because it was always just reruns of movies mm -hmm. so it was like 
it almost, especially, you yeah. Know, if it was like Netflix or, you know, uh, ran it to just stream the movie specifically that you want to watch, but like it was like, oh, let's see what's on HBO, and it was always like the same movie. It is, yeah. yeah. Their movie selection is not the greatest. Yeah, so like the, the, this seems like awesome because now you can go in and, and actually hopefully see a better catalog and get some better and movies. Choose something that you want to watch. Yeah. So. And maybe some more original programming, ideally. Maybe it's the death nail of the cable. This could be, yeah. Except for like, maybe it's the death nail for the cable, except for original series. Yeah, that's true. I mean, if you're taking off all the syndicated, you know, the syndicated stuff, half of those channels are just running syndication of something. Yeah. Yeah. If you start taking, they take all that back. Yeah. That, uh, that'll be an interesting fallout. For all those happens. people that don't have internet. Yeah, that's, and that's, that's the other thing. Yeah. yeah, then you're totally out of luck. <laughs> uh, all right, well, that's... Uh, that's, that's part of Read and Weep right there. Right, there it is. So um, so HBO Max, that's the news. It's officially announced from Warner Media. Are you excited about it? I mean, I, I'm curious about the original programming. I don't care about Friends. That's not going to be enough for me to be like, oh, i got to get Friends. Um, I agree. You know, uh, if, it's, if there's something really cool original, they did have that contract with J.J. Abrams for like $500 million, I think to create original programming, so maybe he'll come up with something that's, that would be worth it. I, I subscribe to HBO now, but I'm kind of seasonal. I think we talked about it last time, which yeah. is like, like normal TV shows, like I'm just not into it, I never was. Yeah. Um, because I hated the, the restriction. Right, right. Yeah. And I feel like the, uh, like Netflix and uh, Amazon and uh, HBO, they have so much more freedom to like, right. do things. Uh, that it'll, you know, hopefully some really good, cool things will come out of it. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, you can read up all about it, digitaltrends.com. We've got the, the whole press release kind of analyzed, giving you the details of what it is. So check it out there. Let us know what you think. Certainly going to be a topic we'll be talking about again, too. Um, let's get to our, a couple more stories here that we need to cover for you, bringing you up to date on what's trending right now. This is has to do with uh, Facebook's Libra cryptocurrency, which they just announced, I wouldn't say a month or two ago, um, very recently that they announced they were going to be having their own cryptocurrency. They partnered with a whole bunch of different companies. And essentially the way it would work, in case you don't know, is you would be able to send and receive money via Facebook apps using their own cryptocurrency. They, maybe even long term, they would set up like ATMs where you could buy um, buy cryptocurrency, buy their Libra cryptocurrency. And the whole idea was to give this just cross global um, way for for people to conduct commerce, and now there's a whole bunch of governments that are like, hold up, that sounds like you're going around all of our government regulations, and that's kind of what they're doing, in yeah. a way. It, well, it's 100 percent is like, yeah. if, if you think about it, like India is the one that's really going. I don't think we're yeah. gonna support this, mm -hmm. and if uh, the Libra's mission kind of right now is allow people to have uh, commerce who don't have access to banks and yep. credit. So, which India is a prime market for that. 100% all mobile. So India is like a huge mobile, uh, you know, uh, enabled mm -hmm. country. And also many people don't have access to banks or yeah. credit there. So this is exactly the market that they're going for. And India going, no. Like, yeah. The other thing, too, is like it's not just regulation. It's it's about you guys are kind of like side skirting our whole economy, right? Yeah. Like, the, the way that money yeah, is exchanged, and they don't back. have any way of, like, you know, being part of that, I think. So. Right, and controlling what's, or, or even knowing what's being bought or sold in the yeah. country. Yeah. And, and the thing that, I mean, for me, like, I just, Facebook, I don't trust Facebook. Yeah. So even if, like, a, well, one, Facebook developed Libra, and right. even though it's a consortium that kind of controls how this is going to be used, it's just got... Too too much taint on it for yep. me. Yep. Like I don't know if I would ever touch it. Yeah, and I think this is this could be a real obstacle for them because that's I mean India is not the only country that's bringing up issues, but that is a big that would be a huge market for them. Yeah. Just for those reasons that you outlined. It's not decentralized either. It's a centralized cryptocurrency. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, we'll see what this does for it. Um, we'll find out though soon. But you can follow up with that and check that out at digitaltrends.com. We've got lots of coverage of that. All right. Uh, one final thing I wanted to break up, bring up here because I know we need to go to break. But this has actually been trending today, and it is this: someone is trying to break the land speed record. Yes, the land speed record with a land vehicle. We talk about um, <laughs> we talk about so much like space tourism and and rockets. This is a rocket for the ground. It's called the Bloodhound. Uh, supersonic car, yeah, which is a great name. Yeah, and this is something a project that's I, I guess been in the works for several years, and they finally got the funding now to proceed with test trials. And 
the record that they're trying to break, the current, the existing land speed record is 763 miles per hour or 1,228 kilometers per hour. And they think they're going to be able to break this next year now that they can go forward. I think they're hoping for 800. Yeah. 800 and eventually looking for a thousand. Oh my gosh. Thought, a thousand miles an hour on the ground. You know, the thing that scared me was they were like, at some point, the speed will be so high, it'll be like driving on ice. And uh, at, at that kind of speed, that's, I mean, yeah, that's just freaky. How do you, I, I don't even know. Like that, the technology behind that's just mind boggling. Like how it can still maintain enough weight yeah. to not just fly up. Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, you know, they were looking for sponsors as well for this to continue, mm -hmm. uh, you know, their, their, their next stages that they have planned out. So it's, it's uh, you know, they're like, it's kind of like NASCAR, I think, like yeah. on the car itself. But I'm, I'm also wondering, well, what's the purpose of this other than just getting the record? And There's got to be a, a good purpose. Point. And I didn't see it in the, the story. We, we didn't write a story on this, but it was yeah. over at the BBC. And uh, I, was, I was looking for that in the, in the story. I didn't see it. I was trying to figure that out, too. And I, I, I read a few different articles on it, and I couldn't see anywhere where they're other than just because. Yeah. You know, and that, that makes it, it. The driver of that car yeah. is just one brave person the driver is actually the same person that broke the speed record before it's an raf pilot andy green so he's going to be the same one behind the wheels and this is a british company doing this it's, too yep yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so this raf pilot broke the record once and now he's doing it again now, i think that's super cool ago. yeah are they going to lead it up with the tv spot they kind of like that to. guy that parachuted uh oh. from oh from yeah space, space? Yeah. yes yeah they need to live stream this that'd be awesome yeah that, oh, man, that'd be amazing. <laughs> well, anyway, you can check that out. And, uh, of course, follow up with everything that we've got here at Digital Trends, all the tech news that you can handle. We keep you up to date on everything and lots of discussions coming up. We also have Felicia Miranda joining us here at the end of the show. Uh, she'll be coming back on to give her expert opinions on the Nintendo Switch Lite and things to look forward to for Amazon Prime Sweet. Day, which is coming up. Yeah. So, yeah, so you have some expert talk coming up. Um, but first off, Dan, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Always it's always fun. fun. It is yeah. indeed. Oh. Uh, <laughs> let's uh, do this. We're going to take a break uh, really quick, and then we're going to come back. We've got dual guests who are joining us. We have John Cheney, the founder and CEO of Seek, and Dave Nielsen, the president of Overstock.com. Great guests that are going to be joining us, talking about the future of retail and implementing augmented reality and how that's going to change our experiences, even as right now, and some of the really cool things that are coming forward with that. So drop in your comments, your questions. We'll be back here in a minute with more Digital Trends Live. Welcome back to Digital Trends Live again. Thank you everyone for joining us. We broadcast live every weekday, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, bringing you tech headlines, news, discussions, and keeping you informed about technology that will affect your life and how we interact with the world. And up next, we're gonna be discussing how technology is changing the retail experience. And we certainly have two experts that are joining us right now. We have John Cheney, the founder and CEO of Seek, and Dave Nielsen, president of Overstock.com. Hello, gentlemen. 
Hello, thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for joining us here. I'm excited to talk about this. I bring up augmented reality quite a bit on this show and just because I, I think that that experience and the way that technology is evolving is really fascinating and what it's gonna be like for us. And uh, certainly I wanna talk about this initiative that you have. Maybe uh, just to start off, can we get a little bit of each of your backgrounds and then lead up to what we're talking about with this, with this technology? Sure. I'll go first. Dave Nielsen, president of Overstock. Been in retail for nearly 25 years. Uh, different organizations from Kayla Shoe Source to Mobile Access to Overstock for about seven years now. Um, and all of that time being in online retail. So really uh, happy to be here with you today to talk about AR. Yeah, and John Cheney over here, um, CEO and founder of Seek. And my background, I'm, I'm a huge technology enthusiast and entrepreneur and uh, have been, I'm always looking for ways to, to use the latest technology in a way that can benefit and, and help improve our world. And that technology is exactly what, what I want to get into and how that's changing. You know, uh, Dave, with your experience, you said seven years at Overstock, so I'm sure you've seen some vast changes just with how quickly things innovate and, and move. What have you seen just, just maybe over that time leading up to what we're doing right now? Well, you know, if you would have told me 10 years ago, that we would be selling sofas online uh, to the degree that we are and the billions of dollars in, in furniture. Um, you know, a lot of people would have looked at you and said there are certain elements, certain products that you will just never be able to, without touch, feel, you know, get a feel for the magnitude of the product, you'll never be able to sell those online. And that just simply isn't the case. And we continue to innovate into new technologies to help us do that every day here. And I think that's a great point that, uh, you know, thinking about that back then without being able to actually visualize and understand what it is. And that's what uh, Seek, you know, is kind of bringing to the table here as well. Can we talk about this partnership and augmented reality in general and what these techn technological innovations are that you're utilizing? Certainly. Seek is focused on making AR for e-commerce as simple as possible. Uh, AR at its core is, is actually quite complicated. Um, but what we want to do is make it extremely easy for the user uh, the consumer, obviously, and, and of course the brand to get that installed. And so what we brought to the table here is, is a, an expansion of Overstock's previous capabilities. They've been doing augmented reality for, uh, for years now in their apps. And, and we said, hey, you know, let's take that a step further and bring it to the website. And that's where we're seeing a lot of uh, very quick adoption in comparison to how it's been over the last couple of years. So how is that changing the, the user experience? Let's walk through what that's like now with these, with these innovations. Certainly. So um, the uh, you know, like I said, Overstock's been doing this inside of their app for a while, but what we, mm -hmm. want to, we want to make that really easy so that it just happens right on the browser, right? So if you're in Safari or on Chrome, you browse to Overstock.com. You might start on Google and search for something and end up on Overstock. And when you're on the product page, you can just tap on a 3D interactive viewer and it pulls it up and you can see that product immediately. So what we wanted to do is not interrupt the user journey. You don't want them to have to download an app if they don't have to and still be able to access this incredible technology. Yeah, certainly would, would speed up that process if you could just go to the website and no matter what browser you are in, yeah, to be able to, to, be able to do that. And you know, things like Sophos, like, that, that's a perfect example to be able to see what that looks like. Uh, what are some other products and services that, that can really take advantage of this? Uh, in home furnishings, it, it's nearly endless. Yeah. Um, millions of products online. You know, one of the things about retail, I mentioned I, a lot of years in retail, it's always about the customer experience. Mm -hmm. And focusing on those customers that, that bring you, uh, that you bring that value to is what we found at Overstock so critical to, to getting this kind of growth that we've had over the years. Um, when you look at the customer, that's buying online. It's all about no hassle, right? It's not just about not going to the store. I don't have to go to the store. I can do this online. But it's also about making sure that when they buy that product, they have the confidence when they buy it that it's going to fit their room, whether it's end table, how that rug is going to look, get laid down in their room. And so the augmented reality really gives the customer a full, complete, no hassle experience. Um, removing the whole returns process as well. Much of the returns can be generated because of, you know, I thought this was bigger than it was, or I looked at the dimensions on the product page, but I didn't realize when I actually visually see it in my room, what it would be like. So it's been a huge advantage for our customers in that. And it's, 
it, that's such a, a great technology, yeah, to utilize. And, and like you said, changing that customer experience, making, you know, enriching that, making it more informed if you're going to be buying something online. Um, looking at it, you know, from where you're at right now, which is, which is great, where do you see this going? If, you, if, if either of you could guess, you know, say five years from now, what that customer experience could look like. I can speak to that. Um, you, you know, right now we're using you know our phones, and these phones are great. But having to hold something up and look at something is is one thing. Uh, we believe that in the next year or two, augmented reality glasses are going to be coming out from Apple, from other manufacturers that are going to make this a lot more part of everyday life. When you have a screen all of a sudden attached to your eye, and now you don't have you can do hands free. You can look around. You can be more manipulative. You can use your hands to to change things. That's going to start to make this, as Dave was talking about earlier, this touch and feel experience almost, it's going to come more to life. And so it's going to just get easier and easier. And uh, the brands that are you know, at the forefront, like Overstock, that are taking advantage of this technology right now, when those you know, advances happen, those, those goggles, those glasses, maybe even contact lenses in the future come, these guys are going to be ready to go. Yeah, be, be well-placed to take advantage of that technology. And it, that's the thing, it changes so quickly and, and so, so fast. Every year, it seems like our advancements are just exponentially greater when it comes to this technology. And I think I, I like that idea, you have augmented glasses being utilized in that and just where that hardware takes us to take advantage of these different aspects online. Well, gentlemen, uh, for anybody who wants to just right now, what would be the best place for them to go to try, out, to try this out? Overstock.com. Okay, there it is. <laughs> Away you go. All right, Overstock.com. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here today on Digital Trends Live. Thank you, thank you. Greg. We'll see you. So definitely a, a really fascinating use of augmented reality, and that is something that you know we talk a lot about here on the show, and that changing experience and how that's going to affect us, and and how we can utilize that in different ways. It, there's a there's a myriad of ways that it's going to be utilized, but certainly uh, augmented reality glasses. That'll be fun to see when that's finally out in the populace. All right, we need to take a break because we have Mr. Luke Larson who's coming in here with uh, not one, not two, not three, four GPUs that we're going to be taking a look at and some processors. We're going to have them here on the table. If you have questions, now is the time to ask those. If you have GPU questions, I know he's got a bunch of stuff to go through and uh, we'll showcase what he's learned so far. Back here in a minute with more Digital Trends Live. Welcome back to Digital Trends Live. Again, broadcasting live across a number of different platforms. So thank you for joining us wherever you're at. Hit that subscribe button. And if you're watching live right now, check out this bounty of computer hardware that we have in front bounty. of us. 
<laughs> I'm Greg Nibbler here, joined by Luke Larson. Hey, Greg. Hello. So, Luke, we have so much to you go can through barely here. see me over, over, the, over the boxes. And, and this is kind of what it's like in the computing office where oh, yeah. Luke goes through all of this stuff. It's just stacked with actually, like a mad is, scientist This is office. quite clean, actually. If you walked <laughs> yes. in there right now, especially after last week, so, you would be disgusted. <laughs> disgusted. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's walk through what we've got here. I know we're going to do a couple of different comparisons with different types. I know we've got the GPUs we'll get to here in a minute, but you wanted to go to the processors first. Yeah, okay, well, well let me just start with this. I mean, it's crazy. Lo everything you're looking at here was launched in the past week. Wow. You know, and it's just a, a huge week for, for PC hardware. It's, like I said last week, it's gonna, this is, um, for sure, will go down as the as the big week this year for 2019. Wow, and, so this uh, is it. Like, you don't think there's going to be another? Um, this is the big this. stuff. There might be some trickle down for the rest of the, the, the you know the rest of the year, but these, this this was the the big launch yeah. for sure. So let's walk through uh, what you, yeah. whatever you want to hit first. So I, I wanted to start with the processors. Um, what we have here, the two new AMD processors in the Ryzen three. We have the Ryzen seven. 3700X and the Ryzen 9 3900X. These are top of the line processors, very expensive and incredibly powerful. So this Ryzen 9 one is the one that I, I focused uh, a lot on, which is a 12 core processor, 24 threads. 12 core. Uh, it's 500 bucks for it. It's a, this is the, in terms of, you know, something you would actually put in a, uh, your, you know, you could actually fit this in your board that you already have. Um, this is as powerful as a processor as it gets. What would um, be the use cases for something that's that powerful? What, we, what do you need 12 cores for is what yeah. you're saying? Because yeah. I mean, it's a good- that's, that's a ridiculous amount. Yeah, so it's a good question because um, as, as people may know, games don't actually use, can't use 12. Most of them are, you know, maybe four cores you could use. Um, so why, yeah, why do you need yeah, 12 why cores? Do you need 12 cores. Um, it's really Other than just for, because, <laughs> <laughs> just to show off. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that was the big question for AMD to answer, as they, uh, they, because they're the ones that keep pushing the core counts over the years, um, and 12 cores in a consumer, you know, processor it does sound silly. But what you can use it for is, you know, 3D modeling, um, video encoding, video editing, anything that rec that uses a multi-threaded any multi-threaded application can put this to use and just go crazy with it. Um, and so what we saw in our test, so we, we put this this one here up against the Intel um, you know, direct comparison in terms of price, and it mm -hmm. kind of sits at their highest end, which is the 9900K, the Core i9-9900K, um, which came out earlier this year. And for the first time, I think, in a long, long time, I can very comfortably, confidently say that this thing, um, it, it beats that. It beats that Intel beat processor. Intel. And yeah, and, it, and what's crazy is it not only does it beat it in core count because that wow. thing is an eight core processor. This is a twelve core processor. So you're like, okay, you know, this is gonna this is gonna do better in certain things. Right. But the the areas that these Intel processors are typically great at, which is single core, just raw power, which makes them really great gaming processors. This doesn't quite beat it in that aspect, but it gets really close, as close as they've ever been. And it, when you when you put these up two next up against each other, you're not going to notice a huge difference in terms of gaming. Um, but then you get these four extra cores, and it's just way better in those other, you know, other you think, multi, yeah, the other uses that you might have for a processor. So it really doesn't make much sense to me why you would buy. Um, by that Intel one at this point, you know, it's kind of like it's close enough in those in yeah. those in gaming and single core tasks, and then way better in in, in uh, multi threaded you know applications. So well, that's pretty. It's that's a, pretty it's a big big yeah. win for AMD, and this week has been um, I think as a whole been a real positive thing for AMD, and probably yeah. good for the industry as a whole. Great anyway, for, for the consumers. Industry. Yeah, it's great for consumers because you know Intel's going to be striking back at this. Yeah. you know later this year or early which is next great. Year. Yeah, they're not just going to lay over like well, all right. We're gonna no, now, you know? no, they've got way too much money in R and D to do something like that. You yeah, know? they they are they have been struggling, but like. Like they're gonna they're gonna, gonna take this them. and they're gonna be yeah they're gonna get pushed into the next level hopefully and hopefully we'll see you know like more the competition continue to rise. Well, these are the processors. The Ryzen. So, those are the new Ryzen uh, processors. And we've got those very impressive. Up we've got the review okay, up. So uh, up. We've got some comparisons, direct comparisons with the um, the Intel chips. So okay. take a look at those. All right. Should we move on to graphics? Let's here? move on to some okay. GPUs. Okay. Let's get those out of the way. Those All right, are, we'll those just move those out of here. Just those are just boxes anyway. Oh, uh, <laughs> secret. Yeah. Um, 
What we have here are four new GPUs. Again, all released last week. It was a busy week last busy week. Busy week. Um, and there's a funny, it, I mean, it was just a crazy, crazy. We talked a little bit about it last week, but mm -hmm. you know, um, these, these new um, Radeon cards from AMD, Planned out, you know, we're gonna we're gonna release them on on July seventh, mm -hmm. way in advance, and then all of a sudden, Nvidia, you know, pushes <laughs> these two, and yeah, they're they're called the RTX 2060 and 2070 Super, um, horrible name, by yeah, the way. but uh, <laughs> you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> like, could it get any more lame than that? I yeah, don't know. it's a super. <laughs> uh, you could do plus. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they just throw those out there, and we're, and everyone is scrambling. Everyone who has to review these things is scrambling. And then on Friday, literally two days before um, the the review, this goes you know on sale, and the reviews are supposed to go live. AMD announces a price cut on them before they even come out. So, you know, we're all, everyone's scrambling. Oh my I gosh, I have to change my review. Yeah, it's a, it's a real, yeah, it's a, it was great it's on Friday. Drama. On Friday afternoon as I was trying to leave. It was really great. Oh yeah, I'm sure that was great for you. <laughs> yeah. But it's great, it is great for, for consumers. It's great for someone, this is like, and this is the reason why I wanted to bring this on. This is the best time to be buying a graphics card right now. Cause yeah, because it. previously you had said, wait until these come out. Exactly, yeah. And, and now we've got them. And now we've got them and you can, you can all the data is out there. You you can you can, uh -huh. you can make your purchase you know kind of within full confidence of what you're getting and and here's here's how it kind of stacks up here so we, at the top is the 2070 super RTX 2070 super from Nvidia um, it's basically AMD doesn't have a card that can compare to this right now okay so um, this is the top of the line that's the top of the line of what we got right. here of course above that the RTX 2080 Super is coming later this month. We haven't seen that yet. And above that is the 2080 Ti. So NVIDIA has this huge range so above more AMD, that are going up. where AMD doesn't really compete in this range. Okay. This is uh, a, uh, let me just make sure I have this right. This is a $700 card. This wow. is incredibly expensive. I don't Dang. recommend this for the average person. Yeah. It's very impressive, but it's not for the average person. Yeah. Um, after that, you have kind of a mixed bag. So this is the RTX 2060 Super. Um, it starts at, Four hundred dollars. Okay. And the competitor on the AMD side is the is this one back here, the fifty seven hundred RTX. Or, sorry, RX fifty seven hundred <laughs> XT. I I wouldn't be able to keep all this straight. Yeah, so, there's yeah, a lot of R's and X's. Here. Um, very interesting design, by the way. You get this little this little bump here. People uh -huh. are making fun of it because it looks like it's a dent. Uh, <laughs> I would probably think that at first, but yeah, I like the look of it. Yeah, so these two are very close in terms of performance. Um, overall, in terms of games, this is going to be, in, in my testing, this was the Still going with Nvidia. by a few frames in each okay. game, mostly. Again, you know, according to different games, you're going to get different prices or different results. But I, I think from, from all my testing, this is the better card. Um, it's smaller. It has slightly better performance. It has ray tracing, RTX stuff that these don't have. Um, I think this one, the 26, I mean, if you get one thing out of all this and you're looking for a card, I think this is the one that will be, this is the one that I'm going to recommend for yeah. like, maybe not the average, it's still an expensive card, but mm -hmm. like if you're looking for a powerful GPU, you're looking to upgrade, this is the one that I would recommend you take a look at. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's still $400, okay. but it'll get you really great gaming, especially like obviously 1080p, you're looking at, you know, great frame rates yeah um, but you can you do 1440p really well 4k is like definitely like most games are all playable but they're not like 60 frames per second so like this is i think for the most people are not playing in 4k right so you know if you're looking at 4k and you want something that is like absolutely great you know you're gonna have to jump up here but um so we've got yeah, these 2060. And then, yeah and this, this is the this here. is at the bottom here this is the uh <clears throat> rx 5700 uh, probably like the most disappointing of, of the of the launches. I mean, this is the cheapest. It's. Uh, we do have a question on YouTube. Oh yeah. Asked, uh, is there a, one you would recommend for VR? Uh, VR. I mean, if you're looking at VR, I think like any of these will be able to handle it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, depending on what you're doing with VR. If you're looking at running a uh, one of the super high resolution. Um, like the um, the Vive Pro or anything that's a, a high, higher resolution, you're going to want to push higher. But I think any of these cards will be able to handle VR really well. Again, I would point people to the 2060 Super. Yeah. We didn't do any like VR specific performance testing, so I don't have like specifics on that. But um, you know, in general, VR, you know, it, it could be handled. <laughs> yeah, by any of these. exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, so this is the, the RX uh, 5700. It starts at 379, so it's the cheapest of everything you see here. Um, it's also like, there's a pretty a large gap between what these are doing and what this is doing. So um, again, it's, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a good showing from AMD in terms of graphics. Not quite what they did in terms of processors against Intel. I think right. NVIDIA comes out of this still looking pretty strong. But still um, impressive that AMD's pushing, pushing the needle exactly, a little bit. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And I mean, don't forget, like the launch of this is what made this, yeah, what, what they had to push that exactly, up. Exactly, you know, so that's, you can just tell right there, okay, there's a push and pull. Yeah. NVIDIA at least feels the pressure and they feel like they need to, you know, put something out there and compete. Which is ultimately great for consumers. And that's that's what exactly. the bottom line is. Exactly. Well, reviews on all of this, all of these are up. Yep. Check so Luke has worked tirelessly to get these up, uh, and and so you can go there and check out all the details and make your decision on what you need to what you uh, want to buy. Uh, Luke, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. And we have more coming up here on Digital Trends. So uh, we're going to take a quick break, and then we have Darren Gucciani, who is the CEO and co-founder of Keeper Security. We're going to be talking about uh, security. So, I mean, security is so important. Your passwords. How do you keep those secure? What are the best ways to fight um, fight people from getting that? And and cybersecurity is such such an important issue. So if you have questions, drop those into the chat right now. Whatever platform you're on, we'll get them. We'll be back here in a minute with more Digital Trends Live. Welcome back to Digital Trends Live. Don't forget that we have full Prime Day coverage coming up on the 15th. So we'll be doing a live broadcast, bringing you up to date on everything of that. So I just want to make sure you make a note of that before we go forward. Also, thank you for tuning into Digital Trends Live. We broadcast live every weekday, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. And we talk about technology that affects you. And in particular, I think we all know cybersecurity is kind of a deal right now. I think you need to be concerned about that. And that's certainly something we're going to be talking about right now. Uh, joining us, we have Darren Gucciani, who is the CEO and co-founder of Keeper Security. Hello. How are you? Doing great. Thanks for joining us. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, I, I really want to get into this and, and talk about just security in general and, and some of the different things maybe that we can be doing that could help make people more secure. Can we get just a little bit of a background on your company, though, and, and what led you to find found it? Sure. So, I mean, passwords are the biggest problem that we see in cyber because they're the number one reason why there's a data breach. Over 80% of all cyber breaches are a result of weak password security. And so, since all of us, whether we're an individual or a business person, um, we're faced with the same dilemma in terms of how we manage those passwords. Do we write them down in sheets of paper? Do we save them in an Excel file? Um, there's a much better way of doing this and handling the password dilemma and the pain point um, from a security perspective. So um, this is what got us started about eight years ago. Um, we built a consumer product, which is called Keeper Unlimited. 
and it works on every smartphone, tablet, computer. So think of it like a ubiquitous digital vault that runs on all your devices. It creates high strength random passwords for all of your you know, sensitive um, applications, websites, et cetera. And it syncs with all of your devices so that everything is really secure and very functional and easy to use. So um, this is where the genesis of the company started. And about just under three years ago, we launched a multi-tenant version of the consumer application um, for businesses. So we now sell the product to you know, small to medium and large enterprises, and it's, it's going fantastic. That's great. That, I like that idea of cross-platform so I don't have to re-log in to something else each, each time it's, it's stored. Yes. Yeah, that is because that it's so, you want to have a different password for every single thing. But yeah, Absolutely. remembering all of those passwords, I don't know how many times a day I have to reset a password for something. Uh, <laughs> I forgot. Well, uh, uh, let's go on with this and, and talking about d some different issues. And I know one that uh, that I want to bring up, and I want to kind of get a definition of this too, is uh, credential stuffing. What yep. what's what is credential stuffing, and what should people be concerned with about that? Yeah. So this is one of the fastest growing um, attack vectors that are being used by cyber criminals. So. The problem that we have is that there are billions of username and password pairs, we call them credential pairs, that are stolen in public data breaches, placed on the dark web, and are merchandised so that other cyber criminals can transact and buy them. And what they do is they know that more than 60% of the time, the average person uses the same login credentials on every website, application, and system. So the, the password reuse is what they're preying on. And traditionally, more than 50% of the time, when they have these key pairs, they're successful in breaching accounts. Because quite often, as you just mentioned, people don't typically rotate their passwords very often. They use the same password on every website or application. And since the cyber criminals know this, what they do is they take this large amount of data and they credential stuff attack a website or a system with these key pairs. And quite often, they're successful in breaching. And so we have a service that we've created called Breach Watch, which constantly scans the dark web for stolen username and password key pairs. It compares them in real time to the information and records that you have stored in your Keeper Vault. Now, this is all done on what we call a zero knowledge basis, meaning we don't see what you have in your vault, but the database that's brought into the vault does all of the AI and work internally so that if there is a public data breach and one of your login credentials has been subject to that breach and is now available on the dark web, we alert you in real time so you can take action to rotate that password and protect yourself immediately. Are you actively on the dark web? I mean, and just for, I guess for anybody who doesn't know, maybe we can get a definition of what the dark web is. Um, but but is that are you actively on there searching for uh, passwords being being sold and and, and, yeah. and stolen so we yeah, have, accounts? Yeah, we have relationships and ties into the dark web through a, a strategic vendor that we work with to bring in billions of credential key pairs into an obfuscated database, which is then brought into your Keeper Vault. Right, and that then does all the queries to make sure that we're constantly updating that database over the course of time. So every single month, um, we are updating this database regularly um, to make sure that we have the most relevant information out there. But I personally have a computer that I only use to surf the dark web. Wow, just so, to keep it separated from anything else. Completely. So, um, I mean, and that's great. So anytime, you know, you see, uh, every, it seems like almost every week there's some company that's had a data breach where, you know, whether it's a hotel chain or a retail chain or somebody loses some, some usernames and passwords. So that's great that you're constantly searching so that way you know if your, if your username or password has been compromised. Um, what are some of the struggles like going from the consumer side into small businesses? What are some of the concerns that small businesses need to have? Well, um, the businesses have the same problem that individuals have, and, and we bring all of our bad habits. If we have bad password hygiene as an individual, we're going to bring the same bad habits, um, you know, in working with a company or, or into our own business. So businesses are faced with a major problem, specifically the small to medium-sized business 
has massive exposure because they don't typically know where to start in terms of cybersecurity. They know what the term means, but when it comes to protecting their businesses, they're really the low hanging fruit for cyber criminals because they don't have formal IT budgets. They typically don't have um, IT staff on hand. Um, they're not set up the same way as a larger enterprise from a security perspective. And so at the end of the day, they're a target um, for cyber criminals. Now, the larger enterprises, including banks, et cetera, we see those breaches too. But the ones that are the most vulnerable are the small to medium-sized businesses. And that's where we really come in um, with a cost-effective solution to help them, as well as the larger enterprises. But I will tell you that you know, just in the United States alone, there's 5 million small to medium-sized businesses. And in, in, in EMEA, which is Europe, Middle East, and Africa, there's 22 million SMEs. And so this is a major, major problem. It's, it's one of the biggest problems out there right now um, in cloud computing because of the proliferation with enterprise cloud, which is now being adopted by small to medium-sized businesses as well. You have this proliferation of additional password use. And the SMBs, you know, from an SSO perspective, which is single sign-on, um, they're not really set up to purchase those solutions. So this is where we come in to really help them. So that's, yeah, that, that's definitely something important. That's a staggering number of businesses that you just mentioned there. That's, that's crazy. And, and, you know, a lot of us are interacting with all those businesses anyway on the consumer side. So it's important for small businesses to be, uh, to, to be taking control of that. Well, if they want to take advantage of uh, Keeper Security, what's the best way for them to go about that? They can go to keepersecurity.com. Um, and download our product. We have a free version that runs locally on all of your devices, or they can go to the app store and install it from any of the, the local app stores on their devices. But we're very accessible. You can also Google the word keeper and we're the first search result. Nice. So we're really easy to find. Nice. So goalkeepers, you're not going to get it. It's going to be keeper security that shows up. Well, yep. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us to talk about this uh, really fascinating thank stuff. You. And I think everybody probably learned a little bit more and definitely we'll be checking out keeper security. Thanks. Thanks for being here on Digital Trends Live. You're welcome. And thank you. All right. So something that we can all learn from there, you know, whether you're a consumer or you're a small business owner, uh, definitely important to take control of your usernames and passwords. Don't use the same password. Let's let's start off with that. But then also go go off and find something a little bit more robust, robust to, to handle that. So we're broadcasting live right now. Uh, here's what's going to happen. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back. I'm going to do a little bit of news. I'm going to inform you about a couple of things. There's a weird deep fake thing going on that I'm going to bring bring to light here on the show as well. Uh, we're going to do that for a few minutes and we've got some more interviews. We're going to have Felicia Miranda joining us, talking more about that Nintendo Switch Lite and also what to look forward to with Prime Day. All that's coming up. Stick around. Back here in a minute with more Digital Trends Live. Hello, it's Digital Trends Live, and you're watching. Thank you so much. I'm Greg Nibbler. Uh, don't forget, you can hit subscribe wherever you're finding us. That way you get the notifications when we do go live. Coming up here in just a little bit, we're going to have Felicia Miranda join us to talk about the Nintendo Switch Lite. But right now, I'm going to bring to light some other news 
that I think that you should know about. So this is uh, an, actually an article that's up at digitaltrends.com right now talking about a new kind of camera and a way that it is seeing light that humans can't. And I'm not talking about infrared light, I'm talking about polarized light. So this is uh, researchers who came up with this. They're from Harvard University's John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, AKA C's, that is a mouthful right there, but uh, very smart people there. And so they've come up with a camera that, that it's, it's not the first time we've had a camera like this that can see this kind of light, but it's the first time it's been able to be brought down to a very small size size. And so it's a thumb sized polarization camera. So what it does is it captures the way light bounces off of objects. So objects that maybe by our normal human sight, we wouldn't be able to see might be translucent or something that we wouldn't be able to tell is there. This can see it. This can tell where that's at. And so with this polarized light, so it vibrates when it hits a surface. Uh, like I said, we can't see it, but detecting that is important for a number of different reasons. There's a lot of different applications this could be applied to. And uh, one being, you know, spotting camouflaged objects. I can only imagine what the military ap you know, applications for this would be. Uh, but keeping it down to this small size, you would see maybe going forward some utilization when it comes to, say, facial recognition software, where it can do a further, uh, a much better analysis, uh, a much better almost a 3D scan, essentially, of what somebody uh, looks like, or analyzing a face, or analyzing objects, or maybe even autonomous vehicles, having something small like this so they can further understand what's around it by seeing how that light refracts, and that way it can get a fuller, bigger picture of it. So this, the fact that it's this small is, uh, is really the key, the key issue here uh, of being able to get it down to that size. Now, this isn't something that's going to be commercially available yet, but it's certainly something that you can see along those lines where soon enough, this could very well be commercially available. Um, really incredible stuff. And I know that's, you know, that's a very brief overview that I just gave of that, but I just wanted to bring that up to date. You know, we like to look at what some of these future technologies are and maybe how they can affect us down the line. You have researchers out there on the cutting edge of so many different things, and we've got you up to date at digitaltrends.com. You can take a look there, go in depth with this article. There's a great video that kind of accompanies it and think about what some of those uses could be. All right, so speaking of future technology, let's talk about something else. You know, I got to bring in a robot here at some point, and I just have to. So this is another space robot. It's actually called the Space Bok, and it's from the European Space Agency. So this is a special robot that they've developed, and you see a lot of space agencies right now Working on different ways, you know, we have all these plans to send uh, landers and missions to the moon, to Mars, to maybe other planets, Europa, but how do we get around on there? And you know, there's different levels of gravity, there's different terrain. This is what they've come up with. So this is a uh, four-legged jumping robot. So it's called Space Bog, and the idea is that in a low gravity situation, that this might be the best way to get around. If you remember the old videos from the Apollo landings, you know, the, the astronauts would jump. That was the best way to get around in that gravity was to jump in, in short hops. And that's kind of what the idea was to this. They also factored in saving energy because you don't wanna to have to have a huge battery on this. So the way this works is when it lands, it actually stores some of that energy and is able to bounce that back. So you're saving a lot of energy by doing the bouncing. It does look a little disturbing when you see it like that um, because you can't picture it taking over, but nonetheless, it's pretty cool. So these were some university students at ETH Zurich. So some uh, European students who came up with this and they're working uh, with the European Space Agency in this idea. And so they're hoping that this would actually be uh, going out to, uh, to a mission in sometime in the future. Uh, right now, I don't believe it's actually uh, gonna, be, gonna be applied yet. They're still in the testing phase, but still kind of, uh, yet again, you know, a unique way to look at robotics, a unique way to look at space exploration. We've gotta test the different boundaries on all of these things until we find the ones that work really well. So it's always kind of fascinating to see where people are going with this. And again, I love finding out what people are working on, whether they're research agencies, you know, you have MIT working on a lot, Carnegie, there's a lot of different places doing this, but this is Zurich in particular for the European Space Agency with the Space Bach. and. Uh, you could read more about that at digitaltrends.com. Okay, this next one's gonna be weird. So, we, we talk about deep fakes. I mean, I think we're all becoming aware, and if you're not aware of deep fakes, we're all gonna be more aware of this, especially throughout this year, and especially coming into the political season for uh, the US. It's gonna be a big issue. And how people can manipulate faces, manipulate videos to make it look like somebody else, make a person look like someone else, make a voice sound like someone else. And there is a, there's a site out there right now that's, uh, in particular, it's a YouTuber named Control Shift Face. 
And I don't believe anybody's found out who the, exactly this person is, but what they're doing is creating pretty uncanny deep fakes. And I've, I'll show a couple of old examples, but this is the example that just was released and this is what was trending today. And it's The Shining is what you're looking at right here. And you're seeing her walk over there where you would think Jack Nicholson would be, but it's not Jack Nicholson because they were able to deep fake someone else into this. And there you go. So if look closely right there, wait till they, he brings his head down. Uh, it's, it's Jim Carrey. And it's pretty uncanny how closely they can match this up. If, when you listen to the audio, you can tell it's off just a little bit, um, but it's, it's amazing what this person can do uh, when, they, when they have that. Yeah, let's, let's bring up just a little bit of audio so you can hear this, and then I wanna show one more. Being grouchy, I just wanna finish my work. So there, that's, that's just a little bit of that. Um, and again, this is control shift face and this this guy's got a lot of them that they've done So there's several other videos that they have up. There's one in particular that came out uh, This was about a month ago. It might have been actually their first video Maybe it was a couple months ago But it's one with Bill Hader and Bill Hader and he's doing an impression of Arnold Schwarzenegger And there's this moment where they do the live deep fake transition that is just Astonishing how they were able to do it. So watch Bill Hader transform right now I mean, if you watch that, and he's doing an impression of Arnold Schwarzenegger at the same time. And so, <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing. Like, yes, if you know it's happening, you can tell, you know, there's a little bit in there, but that's pretty incredible what he was able to do with this. And so, again, that's can control shift face. And these are just some of the deep fakes that are, that are going on out there. A pretty amazing one there. There's also one that they did with Sylvester Stallone and Terminator to where Sylvester Stallone even posted about it saying, this is incredible. Uh, but there's, there's a bunch of them going up. And this is, seems to be done, you know, for fun. This is in light, it, it, you know, in a light mood, it seems to be like, uh, in entertainment value, and, and that's control shift face on YouTube. But to be aware, this kind of technology is out there, so just imagine how else it's gonna be applied. There's a lot that's gonna be going on with deep fakes. So just to bring you up to date on some of that that's happening out there, again, that viral one is the Jim Carrey, uh, Jack Nicholson one. So you can check that out, uh, Digital Trends, you know, take a look at them. There's a whole series of them. Pretty fascinating stuff. All right. You are watching Digital Trends Live right now. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm Greg Nibbler. We do appreciate it. So wherever you're at, drop in your comments, your questions. Right now, we are going to be joined by the CEO and co-founder of Shuffler. It is James Entra. Hello, James. Hi, Greg. How are you? Thank you for having me. Uh, doing great. I'm excited to talk about this because I feel like your platform solves some frustrations that a lot of us have had over the years when it comes to PowerPoint presentations. Um, also, we had uh, Dan Gall in here earlier, and we both agreed the name Shuffler is a fantastic name for a company. So it's, it's well, thank you. Yeah, it's it's great. Um, but let's give for everybody out there who who isn't familiar, can we get a little bit of background of yourself and then what Shuffler is? Very good. I've been technology a while, doing high-end presentations, consulting, uh, exhibits in Epcot Center, helping big medias do advertising with all their uh, high-end video and things like that in presentations through the years. A um, couple of years back, we took all that knowledge and put it into Shuffler. Shuffler is the culmination of 20 years of presentation expertise in the, in the, the business space. What it basically is, is everyone's done a presentation. We all know we get the burning gut when someone asks, and you know on Tuesday you've got to do 10 slides, and you're going to go one through 10. And at the end of the meeting, you're going to say, whew, let's go have lunch. Yep. And it's a one and done. There's no benefit from it. There's no reuse of slides. Everyone's on their own. It's siloed. It's, every, it's, it, it's hard to work with. Presentation management is a strategy that starts with a corporate library of slides. Imagine having 250 slides about your company and what they do, how they do it, what your products and services, your history, and be able to go to that location and quickly just drag and drop your slides into a new presentation. I need the CEO's background. Let's bring in the compliance slide. I wanna see a video about our London plan. Well, we've got it, bring it in, it's just the next slide. And within a few minutes, you are quickly and easily ready to make a new presentation on your company. So like companies, US Bank said they save five hours for every presentation that was created, a new created presentation where clients had to do that. They saved five hours, brought it down to 10 minutes in doing the presentation. Um, Royal Bank of, uh, Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines said they saved 
86,000 hours of time from their entire sales force just by saving a few hours just in that one step of presentation management. That is a crazy amount of hours and time that is spent. And, and it makes sense because every time you're making one, you have to start from scratch and go from there. So this is essentially, actually, let's walk through this from, from what the experience would be like for an employee. So mm -hmm. is there an, a, just a central <clears throat> database? I mean, you think of a company like yep. U.S. Bank, there's, I don't know how many employees they have, probably hundreds of thousands well, of employees. Yes, they do. Uh, um, so basically, people have different business units. The salespeople have a different need than the marketing people, than the West Coast and East Coast. So there's all permissions around it. But when you go in, you see a library of slides. You get to see 200 slides about your company. A slide could be a video. It could be a PDF. Normally, 90% of them are PowerPoints. And when you just see the slide, not, you don't just see a file that says marketing, you see the file with 22 images of what those slides are. You just grab that one slide that you see, drag it into your slide tray, and what you're doing is building a compliant, up-to-date, approved presentation that marketing built, they did their best on it. As a salesperson on the front end, you don't have to worry about the logo being wrong or, or something out of compliance because if marketing did their job, you can do your job. And it adds in social media, like as a salesperson, you say, oh my gosh, you, spent, you spelled international wrong. Yeah. You can just write that as a comment, and as fast as you get a, a note on your Facebook feed, the person who uploaded that, usually in marketing, will go, oh my God, I did spell it wrong. They quickly change it, update it, and if anyone used the slide, it cascades out to every other user in the organization so that everyone is singing off the same sheet of slides. That is great. I mean, I and I love that idea too. Yeah, like a, there's a logo update or something changes with your your statistics that you're using. Yeah, that can be instantly updated everywhere. Also, if your company merges or, apply, or gets a new business or buys a new business, there might be 15 slides that talk about the synergies and why your client's going to know about it instantly because they see it in the news and your salesperson. It'd be nice to have a few slides that really say why it's good for everyone, and they don't have to think about it. Ironically that helps train your people on the field. Because if they have to talk about it in front of the client, they have to show their expertise, and in turn, they're gonna understand why that happened. Um, let's talk about presentation management in general, because you are certainly an expert on it, and mm -hmm. uh, you've even written the book on it. Can we talk a little bit about yes. the book and about what that's about and how, how that applies here? Well, I'll draw a big picture. It's about strategy for presentations. Presentations are a communications medium. I'm gonna take a step back and uh, like 70 years ago, David Ogilvy was a big advertising person, created Ogilvy Mad, or co convinced corporate America that if you gave all of your money to him in advertising and marketing, you would get better creative, better placement, better marketing, and in turn, you can sell more widgets. Now, he gave strategy for TV, for radio, for billboards, for now we've got web and social. And one strategy for TV was get an exotic location with a big actor and a great director and film a great commercial and put it on the Super Bowl and you'll sell all the widgets you can. That's a strategy that's been redone over the past 50 years to the point where each spot is $5 million or something absurd. But presentations are a category of communications that have been overlooked through all these years. Basically, a presentation is more important than that ad over my shoulder because if I'm standing in front of a client giving a presentation, and you don't trust what's on the slide, I don't care about the ad you might have seen on the Super Bowl. You lost that client. Yeah. And through the years, there has been nothing that managed the medium of presentations as a communications medium across an enterprise. Presentation management looks at the enterprise for the whole strategy of creation, use, reuse, updating, broadcasting, presenting, tracking, and the analytics that go into it. Because once you know certain slides and components are used, you know, 50 by times, you might want to put more investment into the animation or the graphic or the explanation or storytelling, let's say. You know, better storytelling means better understanding about your business and sales. And um, presentation management can help everyone in the field tell better stories. Certainly. It's a strategy for presentations and it would, across the enterprise. Yeah, and I would think that would keep you know the the customers more engaged and everybody you know in the meeting and engaged with what's going on. The 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 slicker you know the 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 presentation is the the more it conveys that information. Um, yes, yeah, so I could certainly see that being a Without very a valuable. Yeah, what's business also tool. good about it is, and here's an analogy we can use at at, at any time is um, people do this every day and they don't even realize it. 
you might have been, I'll, I'm going to do an anonymous example. I went to, I was at a restaurant the other night and saw a friend and they said, well, we just got back for Disney World. And I thought, wow, we went to Disney World two months ago. The first thing I do is whip out my phone and I dial up the pictures. I turn my phone and point it right at you. That's a slide. That presentation is following the conversation. In business, if you ask, if I planned on talking about something and you said, whoa, I know that, but tell me about this other component that I didn't know about. If I could instantly reinforce it with a new slide, just like bringing up that, that Disney picture, I am now communicating and letting the presentation follow the conversation as opposed to the presentation forcing the conversation. And that's a big from too, because in the past, you, I'm going to go from slide one to 20. And don't ask me about slide 17. If we're only on three, I'll get to that. In this environment, you can go to slide three. And when the customer wants to start talking and engaging, you can reinforce that with a slide following what they're talking about. Maybe they ask about your facility and a detail of your, your product, and you might have a video on it that you didn't plan on using. Bring up that video as fast as that Disney picture and sit for you know a minute or 60 seconds to watch it. And the person might go, wow, I understand. Let's talk about the sale now. It brings the conversation much closer to, to where we should be in the digital age. That's a great analogy too with the, the showcasing you know, your, your pictures. That makes perfect sense on how that would work out. Um, James, for, for companies out there, for small businesses or large businesses or whatever size of business that want to use Shuffler, how do they get involved? Mm -hmm. Just go to shuffler.com. You can set up a site. It's free for 30 days. Um, we give free training and updating, and we help clients look at all their slides and build that slide library. Because once you get from the one slide to a slide library of organized, now you can manage a strategy for your whole enterprise. Your library is up there. You invite your 30 people, your 100 people, whatever's in your group in. They start pulling from it. Now you know what slides are being used more often, which ones are third in line, your best salesperson always talks about efficiency. The worst one always talks about the history of the company. That's going to be data that's brought up in your next sales meeting. And people are going to be talking about the things that close deals as opposed to what they're comfortable with. <laughs> Makes sense. Well, there you go. So go to shuffler.com if you want to try this out. It sounds like a, a great um, a great idea. And, and James, I want to thank you very much for joining us here today to talk about <laughs> this with your expertise, certainly enlightening. And yeah, if you haven't thought about it before, it's time to start thinking about your presentations and, uh, yeah. and get bringing those up One to speed. One last thing, mm -hmm. I'll show you uh, our book is available on Amazon. And you could also get it off our website just by requesting it and we'll help you out. We'll walk you through anything. So we try to give the information so people can better understand what they're doing. We'll help you through it. That is great. Well, help your business out and get pick up that book. So uh, thank you so much, James, for, for joining us here today on Digital Trends Live. Great, Greg. Thank you. All right. Once again, learning things here on Digital Trends Live, uh, finding out about new, uh, new strategies. You know, if that's something you haven't thought about before, your presentations, time to start thinking about it. So shuffler.com. Go there and take a look at that. Here's what's happening now. We're taking a break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about the new Nintendo Switch Lite. We're going to talk about some, maybe some video game deals for Prime Day. We've got Felicia Miranda, who's going to be joining us, our video game editor from our New York studio. She'll bring us up to date on that, everything that she thinks is important from that announcement. And uh, if you have comments, questions, whatever you want to bring up, go ahead and drop those in there. Back in a minute with more Digital Trends Live.
This is Digital Trends Live. Once again, thank you for joining us broadcasting live every weekday, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, bringing you up to date on all the tech headlines and news. And certainly some of the news today has to do with the Nintendo Switch Lite, the announcement that came out about that. Uh, we knew there were rumors coming along for that and that there was, that was going to be happening, but, uh, but we got some news about it today that it's official. Nintendo released a video uh, say, showcasing it. There's some specifics that we did find out about it, and we're going to kind of go into some details about that here in a minute when we get Felicia Miranda on our video game editor to talk about it. Um, but with the Nintendo Switch Lite, you know, let's let's bring this up to everybody who's watching live. Since we are live, we can have these conversations as we go through the show. Uh, there it is right there. That's what it looks like. It's a solid piece. So as opposed to the Nintendo Switch, which has two, you know, the, the two separate controllers that you can take off, this one solid piece. And uh, there's four different colors. They're showing three right there. They also have a specific one that is for uh, for for one of the games that's going to be coming out. And let me pull up my details here as we go through. And again, broadcasting live. Thank you everybody for joining us. So talking about Nintendo Switch. So the here's where we're at. So the price comes in at $199, so about $100 less than the regular Nintendo Switch. Uh, the Switch Lite also is uh, smaller. I believe it's a 5.5 inch screen as opposed to a 6.2 inch screen. So a little more compact. And you know when you get to that, that actually is. More more compact than you realize. You know, it may not sound like that much when you just say it by, by inches, but it, that is a lot smaller. Um, the Joy-Con controllers, they're built right in. One thing that is different about this, and I do want to know what people think about this aspect, is as opposed to the regular Nintendo Switch, this one cannot be connected to a television. So that's not something you can do with it. So no television connection. Uh, that they, but they do say that the two systems will complement each other and coexist in the marketplace. So they're saying that this, there will be a complementary system to the regular Nintendo Switch. How do you feel about this? Is this, uh, uh, you know, we brought it up at the beginning of the show. Um, yeah, Drew's asking a question here on YouTube. So the Joy-Cons are not detachable. Yeah, they are not detachable. They are actually built right into it. So it's one compact unit. They do have uh, a better D-pad. So the, the do have a better D-pad on this, but otherwise the layout is very similar to the original Nintendo Switch. Um, they say that it has slightly more improved battery life. What that means, you know, that's hard to say when a company just says slightly more improved battery life. Uh, but that's where we're at with that. Again, the, the different colors, yellow, gray, turquoise, um, the light one, and then they also have a Pokemon Sword and Shield edition that is going to be coming out too. They do say that there's a more efficient chip layout. Uh, they wouldn't get into a whole lot of specifics on that. This is just what we have right now. Now, it's for $199, again, is what we're looking at for the price on this. And the release date is September 20th. So with a September 20th release date, it's definitely going to be out, you know, before the holidays. That's probably what they're targeting for. We, we did, we have thought about, you know, who exactly this is going to be targeted for and who's going to be using it. And, uh, and that's something that I believe we can, you know, probably ask Felicia about who would be able to uh, confirm a little bit more of that. So... Again, the Nintendo Switch Lite, I just gave you a bunch of the details on it, on what it is. So we have the backstory on all the details that were released. But what we want to know is what this means. So uh, we're joined now by Felicia Miranda, our video game editor from New York. So Felicia, I just gave everybody kind of the basic details that we learned about the size, the price, the release date. But who are they marketing this Nintendo Switch Lite towards? I think that's a question a lot of us have. And <laughs> with our tech. So, you know, well, uh, that was it. Felicia didn't want to answer me, so she just hung up on me. So that's all that happened right there. So I asked the wrong question. You know, when you're live, that, that sometimes happens. Let's try it one more time. Uh, Felicia, uh, who is the Nintendo Switch Lite being marketed towards? Okay, I don't think, uh, I think we're going to have just too many issues here to, to maybe make this work right now, but um, we'll see if we can get her back on. So that's, that's where we're at right now, but I gave you kind of the details on there. So figuring out who that Nintendo Switch Lite is going to be marketed towards, I think that's kind of one of the issues and, or one of the things that we're, we're certainly been, been thinking about. Um, and then we'll see if, I'll get a notification if she's, if she's back on the line. Uh, this happens sometimes when you're broadcasting live. A little bit of backstory on the Nintendo Switch. About 35 million units have been sold worldwide. Are you a Nintendo Switch user? Personally, I have not had one, but I do like them. I've played them. I love that interactivity. I think that Joy-Con controller aspect of that's going to be um, solid in it. I think that, that might take away from some of that experience. Uh, but again, that's, uh, that's part of what 
uh, what we're finding out here, you know, just about this Nintendo Switch Lite. So $199, September 20th release date. Now, part of the other rumors about the Nintendo Switch is that there may be a more powerful version coming out. Now, that is definitely interesting. And I, I think that's something that might be bigger, you know, might be bigger. Maybe this is already the Nintendo Switch Lite might be enough. Again, there it is, taking a look at it. So you can see there the Joy-Con controllers built in, one solid unit. It's 5.5 inch diagonal screen, 6.2 inches is what the Nintendo Switch was. And uh, and that's kind of where we're at uh, with that. So I'm not, not sure what else we can uh, do here as we go through. Again, talking about the Nintendo Switch, bringing you up to date on everything that's going on with that. Uh, we're working on getting Felicia Miranda on, but we may have a, a couple of tech issues. We do have a full write-up of this, though, at digitaltrends.com that you can go and take a look at, and uh, you can you can uh, take a look at it there and actually uh, read our, what we've found out so far, where we're at with it, and bringing you all of these details right now here while we're live on Digital Trends. So let's give it one shot here. Uh, so Felicia, I've given everybody all of the details they can possibly add about <laughs> oh, the announcement. No on the Nintendo Switch Lite, but let's do one aspect that I can't, that I haven't been able to fill everybody in on, and that is who this is marketed towards. Oh, okay. <laughs> so when I think about what this is marketed towards, I think about kids primarily. Um, I see, you know, households having a Nintendo Switch, the regular one, and, you know, it's for everyone, I'm sure, but, you know, there's always going to probably be someone like me playing it. <laughs> Um, and, you know, kids really love portable devices. You know, kids are the primary market for mobile games. Um, so I can see them definitely being drawn to the Switch Lite, especially because of the 3DS and the 2DS. If you ever see a kid gaming out in, you know, the real world, they're usually using one of those. So I definitely think that would be the market. So going towards that younger audience, uh, younger fans for, for that, as opposed to the regular Nintendo Switch. Now, as far as interconnectivity, are they going to be able to, they, they said something about them being complementary in the marketplace. Do you fill us in on what that means? So I think they mean that it's probably going to coexist alongside the Switch. Um, I already know I'm going to pick one up, even though we already have a Nintendo Switch in my household. Like, we've always talked about wanting to get another one. You know, if someone's always hogging the Switch, it's either me <laughs> or my boyfriend. So um, when games like, you know, Pokemon Sword and Shield come out, Luigi's Mansion, like that's all hitting us in the in the holiday season. And I am not sharing my Switch with my boyfriend. So <laughs> <laughs> I definitely think that if you already have a Nintendo Switch and you don't want to spend the $3.99 on, you know, the version that you can play on the TV, uh, you definitely will probably want a Switch Lite. Um, do you think this is going to affect the 3DS? Is this going to be the, the death of that? Um, I do have a suspicion that that's where it's heading. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Nintendo won't outright say that, you know, the 2DS and the 3DS are like nearing the end of their life cycle. But, you know, the Nintendo Switch, that's getting all the, the, the newer games. Um, and now that they're coming out with a portable version, that is, they've said explicitly this is geared toward handheld only, um, I can definitely see in the future, you know, the 3DS and the 2DS slowly but surely um, being, you know... Phased, phased out. Basically, yeah. Uh, what about games for it, for the Nintendo Switch Lite? So that's the interesting part. Um, it's definitely geared toward the handheld audience. Nintendo has said that, you know, it only supports handheld games. So... Basically, any Nintendo game that, you know, is handheld compatible is going to be able to be played on the Switch Lite. But this also leaves a very, very small subset of games that are not handheld compatible out of the equation. Um, so that's that's going to be the interesting part. I'm not quite sure what games don't support handheld, but I know there are there are a few. So that's going to be something that people should consider before jumping onto the Switch Lite. Uh, as Drew on YouTube just said, uh, so it's Game Boy 2019 is what the yeah. comment was. Yep, exactly, <laughs> which I am not mad about. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, and then, so this is what they did announce, and we've we've heard these rumors forever about the Nintendo Switch Lite. There's also the rumor that there's going to be a, uh, an upgraded regular Switch coming out or, a, or a, a beefier one. Like, what do we know about that? So the rumor is that there is going to be two, uh, you know, Nintendo Switch alter alternative uh, handheld games. And one was supposed to be the Switch Lite, and the other one was going to be 
uh, an upgraded version. So something that could support probably better graphics, um, something for primarily for home. Um, so that probably in a similar sense as the Xbox, you know, it has that, you know, the, the more powerful one, the Xbox One X, and then they have one that's more geared towards, you know, people who aren't so interested in crazy graphics and, you know, things like that. Um, so hopefully they do that. Cause I think that would be pretty awesome. Yeah. To see. I think it'd be great. I mean, if this one's coming out September 20th, you know, maybe that one comes out in November or something for, for the, for the holidays, push it out for them. We'll have to see what happens. Um, uh, speaking of, well, holidays, kind of, uh, Prime Day is coming up on the 15th, yes. which is, it's just huge for technology, huge for everybody. And as everybody knows, in case you don't know, Digital Trends has massive coverage of Prime Day to help you find all the best deals that are out there. We're even doing a live broadcast for four hours on Monday, uh, starting at 9 a.m. Pacific and, and bringing you up to date on, on whatever deals are going on. So follow along with that. But just as a little bit of a preview, what can we expect in the video game category? So gaming will be focusing primarily on the Xbox, the PlayStation, and the Nintendo Switch. Um, basically the major competitors right now in console gaming. Um, so make sure you check, check out digitaltrends.com slash gaming for all of the deals. Uh, right now, I believe GameStop is doing a, a huge sale. Uh, and we did cover that and we covered some of the best stuff that they're highlighting. So make sure you check that out. And, you know, we're going to we're going to be updating our articles on those three different consoles for Prime Day all of, all through the weekend and on Monday and Tuesday. So if you're trying to get like cash in on Prime Day deals, make sure to check that out. And I can tell you, uh, all of the editors here at Digital Trends will be working a lot to make sure that you find these deals. It's, it's hard <laughs> to find all of those things. So trust, trust in Digital Trends. Uh, Felicia's going to be working very hard to find you those deals. So follow along right there. Well, Felicia, thank you for joining us, bringing us up to date on that. I know we've got our article up on the Nintendo Switch Lite. Uh, like you said, mm -hmm. digitaltrends.com slash gaming and uh, follow along for all the Prime deals and everything else in the world of video games. Felicia, thanks for being here. Thank you, Greg. All right, so Felicia Miranda, our video game editor right there from our New York studio in uh, for Digital Trends. Okay, let's kind of go back here. Let's recap what we talked about today. It's been a day. We've covered a lot of ground, as we always do. And so I appreciate every one of you who joins along and, and stays here for the show and, and, uh, and has, joins in on the fun. We had Dan Gall in here, always fun, at the beginning of the show. You had talked about the Nintendo Switch Lite, talked about um, HBO Max and what that whole platform is going to be out. We have a whole article at digitaltrends.com for that. Luke Larson with his four different GPUs and two processors. Um, he, he had his bevy of computer hardware here uh, joining us. So we had him in. We had John Cheney, the founder and CEO of Seek, and Dave Nielsen, president of Overstock.com on the show. Pretty huge guests talking about augmented reality and the retail experience. Darren Gucciani from Keeper Security talking about how to keep your passwords secure. Very important. We had James Entra, CEO and co-founder of Shuffler, rethinking presentations and managing your presentations. Felicia Miranda, who was just there with us, talking about the Nintendo Switch Lite as well. So a uh, lot that we covered here on today's show. And I thank everybody who's joined us, joining us, who joins us here every day. You're, you're great. Hit that subscribe button. Make sure you get the notifications when we do go live. We've got a lot more coming up for you tomorrow. So we'll see you then with more Digital Trends Live.